Hello friends and neighbors and welcome to another commentary. This one is on Charles Dickens' uh, A Christmas Carol, Books vs. Movies review from last year. Um, I kind of figured since I don't have a holiday Books vs. Movies review prepared this year, uh, that just kind of slipped my mind. I was thinking about maybe doing Polar Express, but then I never watched it, so I don't have one prepared for this year. So I thought in, uh, in lieu of that I would do a commentary on last year's holiday review. Uh, so here it is. Um, I don't know why those Christmas lights behind me keep uh, fading off and on. Like, they, they weren't doing that. Like, they don't actually do that. They just stay on, and they weren't doing it when I was filming this. But for some reason, the camera setting or whatever, they were constantly, you know, fading on and fading back off. So I don't know what that's about, but yeah. yeah. Um, this... This idea actually spawned another idea that I haven't been able to, to use yet, um, just because it requires a lot of planning and I really haven't been able to do much with it. But Christmas Carol is one of those stories that has inspired a lot of movie adaptations. Um, and there, there are a handful of, of books that have done that same thing, Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland and, and some of the others that I've, that I've looked at. Um, and I kind of want to do a series where I look at some of those, like, just look at the different movie versions and compare them. Not even to decide which one is best, but just to kind of look at the differences between them. Uh, and I haven't been able to do that yet, and I would really like to, because I think that would be an interesting thing to do. Um, I had a blast with this review. Like, this is, this is one of my favorites. Um, one of the ones that I, that I had the best time working on from an analytical perspective. The editing was, was another story. Um, this was one of those reviews where every, one, every technical thing that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, but uh, from an analytical standpoint, I really enjoyed watching all of these movies and comparing them and, uh, and just, you know, noting all the differences. Um, but last review to use the old intro, and also last review to use the old bookshelf background, and last review to have me on the left side of the television instead of the right side of the television. A little bit of trivia for you there. Which is partly why I, des I divided um, the first 15 into season one and the next 15 into season two, just because there was a sudden change in a lot of different things. And also there was a long wait between this review and the next one. But anyway, um, actually, um, of the five versions of Christmas Carol that I watched, um, I had seen two of them before. I had seen the Muppet version, of course, I watched that, you know, bunch of times, because it's my favorite, still, and uh, I had seen the Patrick Stewart version uh, several times, because I also really like that one, but I had never seen, um, I had never seen the George C. Scott version, which, you know, people look at me like, what, you've never seen, but no, I had never seen the George C. Scott Christmas Carol until last year, I hadn't seen the Alistair Sim, and I hadn't seen the, the Bob Zemeckis one from the, from the year previously, I didn't see it in theaters or anything. Um, so those three were new to me, and the book was new to me, like, I, I had not read the book until I read it for this review. Um, so my, my perception of Christmas Carol was everything that I had seen in, um, in the Patrick Stewart version and the Muppet version. So, I mean, I had the basic story, but there were a bunch of things in the book that I didn't, that, that happened that I didn't know about. Um, for example, just, I, I didn't know how little Dickens had looked at the past. Like, every movie goes deeper into the past, and I didn't know that Dickens had really not looked at it that much. He only really showed th three or four scenes. Yeah, and this is this is something that struck me too as I was watching just the different the different spins that each of the actors put on this character, and even ones that I've that I've seen like stage versions that I've seen that I didn't include in this review, um, just the di different spins that each of the characters put. And I was actually surprised um, that Jim Carrey uh, in the Zeme Zemeckis version he actually did a really good job. Like I think we look at Jim Carrey and we think oh he's just this you know kind of half funny comedian and you know. Maybe some of you think he's not funny at all. Probably some of you think he's not funny at all. Um, I have mixed feelings about Jim Carrey. Sometimes I think he's funny, sometimes not. But he actually did do Scrooge very, very well. I was very impressed uh, with, with how well he did. Um, and I like these different uh, depictions of Scrooge. And I like, I like, the, like the sheer difference... Like the the difference between like Patrick Stewart's depiction and George C. Scott's. George C. Scott's is so underplayed and so subtle. Like it's it's really good. It's really but it's really really subtle. Like it, he just really plays up the cold heartedness. Whereas Patrick Stewart just is just the angry Scrooge. And both of them are good. Like I, I both of them have merit. I think. Um, and Scrooge is one of those characters that you can do all those different things with. Oh, Michael Caine. <laughs> also in the book you really do get a sense of the growth of the character. 
So, um, yeah, there were, there were a bunch of, there were other, like, I, I knew that I was going to do these five. Like, I knew that I was going to, when I, when I was looking to do Christmas Carol, I started thinking, which one should I compare it to? And, of course, it occurred to me, well, why don't I just do a bunch of them? Um, because I wanted to, you know, you got to do George C. Scott, because that's, like, the definitive version. Um, I really wanted to do Muppets, because... I love the Muppet Christmas Carol so much, and I really do think it's a good adaptation of the story. Um, and I wanted to do Patrick Stewart because I'd seen that one and I really enjoyed that one. I thought that one was really good. Um, and so, and, and then I, I had heard really good things about the Alistair Sim. I'd heard that was also a kind of a definitive version. Uh, so I wanted to watch that one, and I kind of wanted to get the more recent perspective from from Robert Zemeckis and Disney. So I wanted to watch that one too, uh, and I wasn't expecting it to be great. Like I was prepared to not include it in the review if it turned out to be less than good. Uh, but I actually really enjoyed it. Like there were there were a couple of scenes that I didn't enjoy quite as much that were you know kind of. Nah, um, which I'll probably talk about later in the commentary, but for the most part, I really, really did enjoy it. I thought it was really well done. Um, but I there were others that I kind of thought about looking at, that, like like a bunch of people, you know, talked about the the Albert Finney um, the, and the the musical, uh, other versions of the movie that I just didn't have time for. Like I probably would have gotten a hold of them and watched them as well. I just didn't have time. Like, I ran out of time. Like, I got the five that I wanted, and then I decided, all right, I'm just going to do this because I wanted this to be up uh, by Christmas. So, yeah, this, this really impressed me with Alistair Sim, um, the Alistair Sim version. I loved the, the, the amount of detail that they put in, in Scrooge's past. Like, they, they put so much into it, um, and they, I mean, they, they really just gave his whole life story, basically, um, where, where in the book it was just the three scenes. They really did tell the story of his life, and they really did show us step by step the regrets. I love this. I love the, you know, here, the, the showing Scrooge in his office seven years on the night that Marley died. I, I loved that. That was great. It kind of brought the whole thing, you know, back uh, full circle to where, where it had been in the beginning. Um, and I love the the last conversation too between Scrooge and Marley. That that whole business, um, very very well done. Like I re and I, and I love Alistair Sims' performance uh, of that. Yeah, and that that was another thing that really really did not occur to me until I watched the movies and started comparing them. Is just with young Scrooge especially how poorly the Muppets did it. Like that's the one thing in the Muppet movie that is really not very well done is young Scrooge, because they make him out to be a bastard from birth. Basically, I mean the other the other versions show him you know having a good time at Fezziwig's party and you know being a, being a kid you know a kid with a rough family life but still a kid you know and showing him actually retaining his youthfulness and the Muppet version is just like he's just as much of a penny pincher and a bastard as a young man. Man, as he was as a as he was as a as an old man, and so that kind of removes the you know moves the purpose of showing him the past. If we show that he was always the same, you know, the point of showing him the past is to show that he was once you know youthful and had a love for Christmas, but then he it, he grew out of it or whatever. So, you know that you know that's something I didn't really notice until until I started comparing them. Um, and this was another thing, like, it, and this this just now occurred to me actually um, with Marley. Um, the Patrick Stewart version is good, and the Muppet version was good. And those are the two versions that I'd seen. And then I read the book, and then I started watching the movies, and I watched the... Al I don't remember which one I watched first. I think it was George C. Scott. I watched the George C. Scott version first, and it was like, you know, he started... You know, he, he came on, and he started doing all this. And I was like, what the hell is this? Because I had come from... You know, Patrick Stewart's version is very, very subtle, and probably, honestly, the best one, even though I like Statler and Waldorf a little bit better. Um... But that's just me. Um, but Patrick Stewart's probably is honestly the best one because it, he does actually uh, play it very subtly. Um, but I really like Statler and Waldorf uh, as well. And then to see the guy in George C. Scott just doing all this, you know, boogity boogity stuff. And then Alistair Sim was even worse. Um, and I mean, and, and the Robert Zemeckis one was okay. Like it wasn't as bad, but there were just a couple of moments that you could tell they were playing up for comedy. And it's like it's not. That's not supposed to be comic. I mean, yeah, his jaw comes loose and that whole thing happens, but, 
the way they did it in Zemeckis was just goofy. Like, they did that in Patrick Stewart, too, and it worked. Like, it, I mean, you know, the CGI looks a little weird, but, but I mean, it, it you got a laugh out of it, but you were still kind of creeped out. Like, it, like it really worked in that way. Whereas in the Bob Zemeckis one, it was just goofy. Like, it just kind of, okay, you set up a great atmosphere, and then you blew it with that scene. Thanks a lot. There are a couple of scenes like that. Like, for the most part, I like Zemeckis, but there are a couple of scenes that just... One of them irritated me, and one of them I just got angry at, and I'll you know talk about that later. And you probably know which one it is already if you're if you were paying attention to the review and, and watch that, you probably know which one it is. But yeah, there was one scene in the Robert Zemeckis version where I just got pissed. <laughs> oh, this this scene still to this day the the Cratchit family in the Muppet version that scene still to this day gets me teary eyed. I'm serious, like Kermit and Piggy and you know Frog and Pig puppets and they still elicit an emotional response that's one of the amazing things about the muppets like i just watched the muppet movie the new muppet movie a few days ago and that's one of the amazing things about the muppets they're puppets and they're goofy and they're you know they're just out there wacky and silly but they can be really really touching like they're real they really have real characteristics they seem like real people for lack of a better word and they can elicit an emotion and they do it very very well and i think the the muppet christmas carol really shows us that with the with the cratchit family i i love how much we learn about the other characters in some of these versions i like how much we see of them um i don't know why they named her alice in the alistair sin version maybe they thought you know, Bell wasn't a common enough name. I don't know. It was just kind of weird to me. So, so in general, I like the characters better in the movies, even though I like the story better in the book. Yeah. The characterization in the in the book is pretty. I mean, it's it's pretty much here's a character, here's a character, here's a character. They don't they don't really delve uh, as much. I mean, Scrooge obviously they do, but even he's more pretty pretty generic i guess that's kind of weird to say because he did kind of create the the scrooge uh, stereotype so i guess it's kind of weird to say that he himself is a stereotype and he probably isn't and i'm just speaking in ignorance now but whatever <laughs> when do i not <laughs> yeah. i'm on the on the imagery round now oh, my hair was short yeah. Oh, that that bit you're seeing at the beginning, that's the Robert Zemeckis version. I like that. Like, I, I appreciate, in all the versions pretty much, I appreciate that they do still continually remind you that this is a book. Like, a lot of movies don't do that. Like, they just, oh, here's a movie, and then in the credits it'll be based on the book, and you won't even know that it was, that it was originally a book. But with this one, they do make it clear from the get-go this is a book, and they kind of have this indication of, this is a book, this is a timeless story, this is a Dickens story, you should go read this. You're going to see that clip with the, with the clock chime and the shadow. You're going to see that a lot because that was one of the technical difficulties I had. For some reason, I could not get the entire Bob Zemeckis version um, ripped onto my computer. I could only get about half of it. So, like, about midway through the, the present, the, with the, the scene with the Ghost of Christmas present, it just stops. Um, and so for the for the rest of them, I had to find clips on YouTube, like promotional clips for the, like the scene with the Cratchit family that you see is actually a promotional clip that they put on YouTube. Um, and anything that shows the Ghost of Christmas future um, is from the trailer. So I really, I mean, I really had to get creative with what I was showing there. Unfortunately, they got some really good shots of the Ghost of Christmas future, so I was able to use them. But yeah, I had, I had all kinds of technical difficulties with that one. Um, Sometimes some of the more modern things, like one, the ones that are like shot in 3D or, or something like that, you know, I have I have a hard time ripping them on. I think something they do with the technology, I have a hard time ripping them on my computer. So that was one of that was the major technical difficulty, and then it just took forever to edit because there's a lot of clips. <laughs> this is this is more movie clips than I'd ever had in a review. It is yeah. This is one of the things that really impressed me about reading Dickens for the first time is just, I was expecting it to be boring, I was expecting it to be, you know, I, I just wouldn't get into it, but he really does write well. Like, obviously he writes well, he's Charles Dickens, but like, he actually tells a good story. It's not just, you know, meaningless prattle, like, he, he was paid by the words, so he was padding out his stories and that's fine, but, I mean... 
they're good words. They're great words. I mean, you eat them up. You really do. Um, and, you know, Charles Dickens just has some wonderful descriptions. Um, just the way he writes the story is just really, really good. Um, and I, I was not expecting that. I was not expecting to be actually getting into the story. Um, I was expecting to be bored to tears because the one experience I'd had reading Dickens before this was something that bored me to tears, but then I was 11 years old. Yeah, I did not realize um, when I filmed this and when I wrote this that Jim Carrey actually did do the voice of all the ghosts. Um, I didn't realize that until I was editing, which is why I put the little, put the caption in there later. Um, I wish I had because because I would have pointed it out. Yeah, right there. I would have pointed it out actually in the review. Um, but regardless, I still don't really care for the way that he does the voice of, of the past. Um, like the, the present and the what what little he probably does for the future is fine, but I really don't care for the way he does the voice of the past. It just got it's just kinda of annoying. Like he's he just talking in this wispy voice and it just it just really got annoying after a while. And it was just like, okay, get on with it, get past it. You know, talk like a normal person for a while. Um, so yeah, that that was just mostly distracting. Um, not one of the things that I really hated about it. Watching this again, I'm realizing I, I've gotten a little bit lazy with the way I put clips in. Like I, you know, I actually put in a lot of clips and I showed a lot of stuff in this review. Um, I'm not doing that as much anymore. And I don't know if it's laziness or you know, fear of copyright um, problems, because um, I am actually getting paid for these now. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not doing it as much. Like I'm putting more stuff on the television behind me, um, and I'm not showing as much. I'm only showing stuff when I absolutely have to. Um, I guess with a lot of the Christmas Carol ones, I'm not quite as worried about. But... This round, I would like to rewrite. Like this is this is one round that I would like to rewrite because I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't come off very well. Like it's a win for book, and I still, you know, I still maintain the argument, but I just wrote it in such a way that it sounded like a win for movie. Like it sounded like you know movie you know, Hatter had this big long thing about here are some of the things that the movie does well and then book Matt sit, co just basically comes on and says but the book's better the end and, and that was it like you know and it just it's just like he made the argument like I can I can kind of trace what I did and I can see he made the argument and movie Matt was basically just saying here are some things that the movie w did well even though the book is better but I just didn't word it very well and I wish I could go back and kind of write that a little bit better um, so that, so that I would better reflect, like, what I actually do think of this. Um, but I do, I do ultimately think that the book present is better just because of the scope. Like, each of the movies shows, like, a little bit of, little something, like, they show a little something extra, but the book has the, the scope that the movies don't always, um, which, which I appreciate. Yeah. Ghost of Christmas Present is always fun. I love that. <laughs> as soon as I saw that in the movie, I was like, yep, yeah, that's going in the review. <laughs> I feel like I should use that as a joke on occasion, too. Like when a character says something stupid, just show that scene with him hitting them over the head of the torch. Yeah, the Ghost of Christmas Present is always fun. I love the George C. Scott Ghost of Christmas Present. Like, I absolutely love him. And I love the Robert Zemeckis one, too. Like, that one is also really well done. And that, that's something I mentioned in the review, just the fact that in most of the versions that I see, you know, the idea of the Ghost of Christmas Present is that he lives for a day. Like, he lives for a day and then he dies because he's the ghost of Christmas present. He's, you know, just exists for that one year of Christmas, that one day of Christmas. Um, and he's always, he's almost always old by the end. Like, by the end of the day, he is aged considerably, but we don't actually see him aging throughout the day, except in the Zemeckis version. Like, I looked, and you can actually see bits of gray appearing in his beard, and, you know, they, the, the spots of gray get bigger and bigger. And so he does actually age throughout the day. Which I which I appreciate, which is just a, you know that was always something like why doesn't he age throughout the day? I don't understand that. Yeah, this is you know it was just kind of the book's better though, you know, and that's all I just say the book's better. Yeah, just because I say so. So yeah, I need I I would I would like if I could go back and do that again, I would um, and make that better. But now you know, now those of you that actually watch the commentary, you know how I feel about that. <sighs> now we get into the future. The the one the one thing that the movies just 
well, not the one thing. That and Marley. Like, the future and Marley, those are the spots where visual adaptations really, really don't do nearly as well. Because um, they, they take the whole spooky thing and, you know, magnify it to the nth degree. Um, the Ghost of Christmas Future is supposed to be spooky, so we'll make this whole scene spooky. Um the you know marley scene is supposed to be spooky so we'll make him you know like a ghost and the marley scene is supposed to be spooky like that that is supposed to be genuinely scary but it's because marley has come back to life it's not because he's you know jumping around and yelling and doing all this stuff but because he's come back to life yeah that always bothered me about the patrick stewart version that you can see his eyes and like i've seen versions of this scene god He's so obviously rolling on a platform. It's like, come on, guys, you can do better than that. <laughs> but that always kind of bothered me. And I've seen visual adaptations where you can actually see, like, some sort of face, like a mask of some sort, and it just, it doesn't work. Like, it's just, you're not supposed to be able to see his face. And that's one of the reasons, one of the big reasons why I don't like the Mickey Mouse version, which I didn't include in this review, but I have seen it. That's one version why, reason why I don't like the Mickey Mouse version, because... In the end, he's a cartoon dog with a cigar. Come on. Come on. No. No. You fail. You fail, Mickey Mouse. You fail. Yeah, these ending scenes, almost universally, are just so bombastic. And again, the Muppet is the one that does it right. The Muppet version is the one that does it right. Okay, this scene. This scene, the chase scene with the Ghost of Christmas Future, he becomes like a horse and chariot and starts chasing Scrooge down, and then Scrooge like gets tiny or something, and, and he's tiny when he's watching the scene with old Joe, and it's like, oh my god, are you kidding? It's pure padding. It is pure padding, and it is so annoying. It is there strictly to show off the 3D. It, there's no other reason for it, and it just completely defeats the purpose of this character and of this scene. It's not supposed to be spooky. It's supposed to be sad. It's supposed to be troubling. It is not supposed to be just outright in-your-face scary. And it pisses me off. You don't need that scene. I was sitting there watching. Seriously, it, it goes on for like six minutes. I think I actually timed it. It goes on for like six minutes. I was sitting there watching. We just had the, whatever the first scene is with the bankers or whatever. Um, and, and you know, he gets chased down. And I was just saying, okay, we're supposed to visit old Joe now. Let's go to old Joe. Because I know the story. Everybody knows the story. We're supposed to go to old Joe now. Come on. Move along. Move along. Six minutes later, they finally move along. But good God, it took them forever to get there. And I was just like seething. Like, are you kidding me with this? You know, the other ones were bad enough, but are you kidding me with this? So that's the one That's the one thing that really, really bothers me about the Zemeckis movie. Like, other than that, it's really good, but that one thing. And there are a few other times when you see hints of this where it's like, okay, they're showing off the 3D, they're showing off the 3D. But that one scene is just so blatant and, oh, I hate it. Whew, rant over. Sorry about that. <laughs> On the <to> story. <laughs> Isn't this fun? Don't you love commentaries? All right. Um, this one, like, th this was a tiebreaker for a reason. Like, the movies are all really good, and, you know, I was having kind of a hard a hard time deciding which one, which one should I go with. Should I go with the book? Should I go with the combined movies? And I just, you know, was, was thinking about it, and I finally came to the conclusion that I come to at the end of this, you know, just kind of saying, okay, these movies are great. They're wonderful, but there's so many of them this story is, you know, I mean, obviously it's been around for a while, but a lot of stories like that have been around for a while, and they haven't inspired this many adaptations. Like, it's just like, so, so I, had, I had to finally say, you know, I don't normally make this argument, because if I did books, it would win every, every time. But the fact that the book inspired all of these different visual adaptations really does mean that the book is better. And besides which, we're still remembering the book. The movies are actually really incredibly faithful to the book the original material. They even have like lines that are word for word the same because we have come to expect them. Like this montage of lines that I'm going to put in here in a bit. Um, we've come to expect those lines in Christmas Carol adaptations and many, many more like them. And it's because of the book. Because they are Dickens' words. They are Dickensian text. You can't, you can't mess with that. It's Dickens. So, I mean, the, the book is still the one that we remember and it's still, you know, being read all the time. 
Yeah, and you know this, ha actually having Gonzo be Charles Dickens, like that was a brilliant choice, actually having Gonzo be Charles Dickens and actually tell the story. And it's one of the few times when narration is actually really effective because he's there throughout pretty much the entire thing. And what I like about the Muppet movie actually is that they remove him and Rizzo when they go to the future. Because it's like, okay, these guys are comic foils, ultimately. We can't have them in the future. So they removed them and that kind of drove the point home. It's like, oh, well this is serious now. I mean, we still have Muppets in it, but like, okay, we don't have Gonzo around anymore. This is serious now. Like, this is a big deal. So, and even at the end of, of the Muppet Christmas Carol, like the last thing that Gonzo says before they, before they fade out, before they go to the closing credits, the last thing he says is, oh, if you like this, you should read the book. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, you should read the book because it's amazing. <laughs> so it, it inspired all this. So, so yeah. Um, and it, I kind of kick myself now that it took me so long to read it, but now I have, and it's, it's wonderful. It's a great book. Um, yeah, and I had to end it this way with all the, and um, I don't have all the Tiny Tims because again I don't have the Bob Zemeckis one uh, saying his saying his God bless us. So I just went with the first four and hope that nobody would notice. And as it happens, nobody really did. So <laughs> nobody commented on it anyway. So, um, but that's why I didn't have the Bob Zemeckis Tiny Tim saying his God bless us because I didn't have that portion of the movie. <laughs> Eight to seven single digits, isn't that cute? Ah. Uh, so that's this this review. Um, that's the review of the Christmas Carol, uh, the commentary on the Christmas Carol. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you all have a wonderful holiday, a Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever it is that you happen to celebrate, um, a winter solstice, whatever. Um, just enjoy your holiday and be safe. And um, I'll see you next time. Little Mermaid. Ooh, I've already done a commentary on that one, so never mind.